chapter two on collecting collecting the data for the way. So what I'll go over uh, for this section is to talk about some sampling guidelines. Th these are not exhaustive, right? So these are, I'm just going to talk about here some of the key things that were raised or that are raised often, the frequently, frequently asked questions and, and frequently, frequently answers to frequently asked questions. Um, so, so yeah, so by no means would these, be, these issues we'll talk about today be exhaustive, but these are just the key things that usually come up. There could be more, especially if some of you would like to use it. I'm sure we will learn, <laughs> learn more uh, on sampling and, and implementation. Oh, also, so we'll start with the sampling guidelines first and then we'll do the exercise. So, um, so the first thing I wanted to say about sampling is what is your population of interest? Because people always ask us, well, what sample size do I need? And somebody already asked that this morning. And our answer is always, well, what are you trying to do? What is your goal in, in your survey? Because it, it, depending on what that goal is, then we could, you know, you may want to consider different options. So, for example, you know, who, who, what is your population of interest? Are you interested in the whole country or you're just interested in the zone? So, for the future, for example, they were only interested in monitoring the areas where their projects are, are happening. So, they were only interested in the zone. Uh, but for Bangladesh, you know, the, the, they were interested in the whole country. So, they made sure that it, they had a nationally representative survey. Um, if you're working in a specific intervention, in a specific value chain, for example, uh, I, I'm currently involved in a project in Bangladesh on agricultural value chains, and it looks at the mung bean value chain. So we're only looking at mung bean farmers in the Free the Future zone, for example. So depending on who your population of interest in, then that helps you sort of define where you know where you're going to do your survey and who the who your population should be. Um, you may want to think about oversampling specific groups if necessary. So. Will, they, will there be female-headed households, for example, that you're worried about not reaching, in which case you may want to oversample them. This is sort of what happened in our pilots, right? We wanted to make sure we have enough female-headed households, so we deliberately oversampled them. Uh, household with young children, children if you're, look, you're interested in nutritious value chains and you want to look at impacts on nutrition, you, you need to look at household or find enough households in your sample that will have young children so that you could assess those nutrition outcomes against. Uh, there may be certain ethnic groups uh, or certain types of households that you may think of uh, oversampling. Um, be careful not to exclude the landless. Uh, and this came up even in the baseline very early on in, in the way as they were rolling it out to the Feed the Future countries, there was one um, there was one country that wanted to use a filter question. Similar to the LSMS questions where are you cultivating land? And what they wanted to do was that if you're not cultivating, stop interview, exactly. So they're not going to be interviewed. The problem with that is, so we're trying to assess women's empowerment, inclusiveness in agriculture. If you exclude that household, then you will not be able to measure, uh, yeah, women's empowerment in households of that type, which is very important. It's a big omission. Um, this happened actually in in one of the countries in Tanzania. Their survey had this kind of filter question with only households that own land, not even the are you cultivating, but own land were not asked, if they did not own land, they were not asked the way of questions at all. So we couldn't calculate it for them. We were wondering, why were there so many dropped households? It was such a big survey, but so many dropped households, that was the reason. So be careful about that. Um, because even if they don't engage in agriculture, it doesn't mean that they're not participating in agriculture. Um, so, you know, sometimes uh, in many places, post-harvest processing or subsistence activities, homestead production, home gardening, even though these have, have value or contribute to household well-being, women or the enumerators or you know, people in general don't consider them to be farming or they don't consider it to be agriculture. So they say, oh, I'm not participating in agriculture and you miss, you miss that household. So that's something we want to avoid. Uh, so whenever, you know, be, just be aware of this, of this issue. You want to make sure that you're including all the households you're interested in. If you exclude them, be clear that you're deliberately excluding them, not by accident, that you accidentally drop them because 
you didn't intend, you didn't think about it. So drop them if you need to drop them, but, but be, but be um, conscious about it. Uh, you want to collect the way in the same households as other key outcomes of interest. So for example, in Ghana, for the Ghana Feed the Future survey, they collected the nutrition, um, consumption, and uh, WEA modules with it, you know, for certain households. They had an entire survey for that. But the agricultural production module was a different, completely different survey with a completely different sampling frame. So the implication is that we cannot compare, we cannot link the two, right? Because you, for a specific household, you only either have agricultural production data or the, uh, the rest, or uh, including the WEA. So the only way you could analyze is at the high level. So you have the number for agriculture. You have like agricultural productivity for the entire zone. That's from that other survey. Because they're both representative of the zones, right? But they're different samples. So you, you know, they're, they're, it's limited what you can do with that. So, so, so if you're intending, if your research question is intending to link the two at the household level, at the individual level, make sure you have both information, sets of information for the same household. If all households within a larger survey cannot be surveyed due to time or budget constraints, we recommend random exclusion or random inclusion of households for the WEA module. So some people were saying, well, you know, we have 4,000 households in our sample. We cannot afford to do two, you know, two interviews. It's too much. We cannot do it. So one of the things we suggested was to save money was to say, okay, you can randomly select Within your sample, you've already defined your sampling frame. Within that sample, you could randomly select certain households to receive an additional WEA module. And as long as you manage that design randomly and you know you understand how, how many you need, so it depends to what your goal is for collecting the WEA. Are you just collecting a high level measure or do you want to also disaggregate? Obviously, if you're not doing it for the entire, let's say you're doing a survey that's representative of all the provinces or the regions at the region level, but your WEA is only randomly, you know, met, you know, you you have only say 300 households as an example. Uh, you cannot expect to be disaggregate having a WEA for every region. You cannot. You will only have it for the overall, right? So those are some trade-offs. But but we would rather that you collect the whole thing with maybe a subsample. Uh, that's you know um, rather than rather than skipping it because there there's a lot of information that you can get out of the way, especially the gender parity measures that you cannot get in any other survey. Who is interviewed? So we choose respondents based on their self identification as a as a decision maker. So we ask for who who in the household. Who is the primary male decision maker in the household? Who is the primary female decision maker in the household? So often there are married couples, but not necessarily. So as long as there are adults, and adult here is defined as 18 and above, um, then they can be interviewed. You could have two people in the household as respondents. Um, Male-only households are excluded in Feed the Future surveys, as I said. But not only because we couldn't find them, because actually I heard about an example, and I forget the country now, uh, where they said actually there are quite a number of male-headed households with dependents, but without women. So that was quite interesting, and I, I, I should try to remember where, where I heard that, but it, it, it's possible. The problem with, that, with this is that actually, if it's a male-only household, they don't enter at all in the way of calculation. Why? 5DE uses women's scores. GPI uses women and men scores. So if all you have is the men score, then they drop out by default, right? So the methodology also restricts us that we don't we don't actually use this information. Um, so again, a uh, rule of thumb is about 350. So so in general, for any type of WEA, you should have at least 350 or more. And then depending on how large that is and what the design is, that could limit the extent to which you can disaggregate. So if you're doing an impact evaluation, it would be 350 per arm minimum or 350 per sampling unit at which you wish to calculate. So, okay, so some best practices on implementation. One is ensuring privacy. So 
because in the Weya, we're very interested in their own perception. Uh, and, you know, as Zihad had mentioned in the video, we don't want their responses to be influenced by others in the household, or we don't want them to change their response because they think somebody can hear them. So we want to make sure they have privacy. Uh, so um, the, way, the, the way we recommend to do this is to have two enumerators, one male and to interview the male respondent, and then one female enumerator to interview the female respondent. In most places, this works better because the female uh, respondent feels more comfortable talking to a fem another female and vice versa. So a, fe a male respondent may not respond to a female respondent, in this, uh, female enumerator in the same way that they would a male enumerator. So this is sort of good practice. If, if you can afford it, this is the, the best way to do it. Also, if you have two enumerators and you catch them both at home and you're lucky, you can do that. You can, um, you can conduct the survey separately. In, in different parts of the household, or somebody's inside, somebody's outside. And that way, you, you avoid this risk of somebody overhearing. Uh, one tip that I heard from a colleague who actually had done some Feed the Future baseline surveys is that when you, when you have just one enumerator, so you have to do both, uh, one after the other, and both of them are there, they said, do the male interview first. Why? Because uh, the woman, so this is what she says, the woman is busy. She has other things to do. She's not going to hang around and listen to what the, the interview is, ha what the, the, the man is saying. Whereas if you interview the woman, the man will be around. If you, you know, he's going to be listening in. He's going to be wanting to know what's going on. So do the male interview first. And then they said, by the time you're done with the male interview, he'll be tired. And he wouldn't want to. He's not going to stay around. And he already knows what the questions are. So he's not going to hang around for the female interview. Training, training, training. So, so important, especially in this survey because this is a new tool. Uh, a lot of other surveys, you know, some, some of our partners have been doing surveys, you know, the same survey over and over. Some types of questions they're very used to asking about. Production surveys, I think, are quite common. They answer those things. So they're very familiar with those tools. But the questions we have here are not your typical questions. Uh, so these are very unfamiliar. So you want to allocate sufficient time for training, especially if this is a new survey, if it's the first time that they're doing it. You want, uh, just to give you an idea, like people ask us, okay, so like half day is enough? I'm like, no. I mean, look at you guys. You were just doing one, and that was just one exercise. It's already, it took us 30 minutes or more, right? So imagine if you had to not just do way, but also implement a bigger, a bigger thing. So you, you, you want to, don't skip on the, on the, on the training, because the training will backfire. If there's no training, you will come back with a, a data set that you cannot use, you know, if it, if it becomes really bad. Like that example I told you about where they didn't interview any of the landless. Um, so go over every question, because different issues come up in different contexts. So this is particularly important for a cross-country tool like this, where they use it in different countries. The questions we get from, you know, uh, implementing partners in Africa are very different from the co questions we would get from like South Asia. So, so even though you think people know this question, group membership people know this question, still go over it because actually, you know what, we ran into a problem with group membership. In the Ethiopia data, they said so many people dropping out because they're not members of groups and we were like, that is impossible. How can there be no groups in Ethiopia? They, it turns out that they understood it to be formal groups. Whereas the intention was for any type, formal or informal group. So this is a training issue because the enumerator should know that even if it's, oh, I just have some savings group that doesn't count, it counts. It should be recorded, right? So that's a training issue. So conduct pre-tests, you know, do mock interviews, practice, practice, practice. Um, adapt the survey to your context. So uh, you, when you look at the tool, there are prompts there that says, you change the examples. Make sure these are context-specific uh, context examples. In the stories, beans, change that. If this is not a bean-growing area, change, those change the names of the example people to locally relevant ones. Don't use SEMA if SEMA is not a common name in that community, right? Use, use culturally relevant examples, accurate translation. And if possible, if you can get a back translation, that will be ideal. Because a lot of things get lost in translation. 
sensitive modules can be moved to the end of the survey. So I think somebody was asking us over lunch about, oh, I think it was Katina, about how do you, if you are integrating this in a survey that's existing and you're already asking about assets, you're already asking about groups, and you already have parts of this in, in other parts of your survey, what do you do? Can I move it around? And, and the answer is, to some degree, you can. What you can't move around is within a submodule, you cannot change the order of the questions because there's a skip pattern there. But this submodule, say group membership, if you want to do it ahead, you can. If you want to move vignettes to the end because it takes a long time, you can. So to some degree, sequence is not too much of a problem. But within a subsection, you don't you don't want to. Be, you can't ask credit before you ask whether they have a loan. Example, right? You can't ask if they make decisions on credit if you didn't know if whether or not they have a loan. Some of these are, are there, you know, for, for a reason logical. Um, but whatever you do, check that your adaptations do not affect how the indicator is calculated. So sometimes some people get a little too um, crazy with, well, not crazy, but uh, they do they do make a lot of changes, right? So let's let's say. There was one example where for the autonomy section, the, the motivation and decision making, they changed the response categories. So remember in the original, we had always true, somewhat true, never written. So four, four codes, right? They changed it to five. So when we're scoring it, they're saying, oh, how are we going to get the score? It's like, you should have thought of that when you change it to five. <laughs> Right? You should have asked us first if that was okay or if that was going to be a problem. And actually, it is a problem because it's it's an even number by design. Because when you're using um, uh, a Likert scale, and some some people might be, you want to use even because when you have an odd number, people gravitate to the middle. Yeah. So you want to force them to decide which Probably which half yeah. they want to fall on. So you'll notice that all of these are even numbers, and that's that's even by. By, uh, by design. So some things like that, it seems like a small change, but it doesn't. So you need to, so just double check. Uh, some things you can change the codes with no issue, right? If our cutoff is having some participation in the decision, regardless of who is the decision, who, who is the joint, I can choose either to elaborate on who the joint is, I can ask them to say who exactly are the other decisions, or I cannot worry about that and says joint with somebody else, I don't care who the somebody else is. It doesn't change. So those changes, they're fine. So just check that it does not affect the calculation. So in general, as a rule, in the tool, the rows are adaptable. So you can change the rows to reflect what's common practice or what's uh, applicable to your country or community. The columns are not. Right? The columns are the questions. You stick to the questions. You don't change the questions. The rows, you can manipulate. So if this is not a place where there's fishing, drop it. Or this is not a, you're not doing a livestock project, nobody has livestock, drop it. Or this is a pastoralist community, nobody grows crops, drop the crops. Right? So, so the rows, or you know, there are, in this community, nobody has a cell phone, so we drop the asset line with cell phone. Or there's another asset that's important, jewelry, for example. We add it. So you can both add and subtract from the. And then our next thing is I'm going to show you how, uh, how the questions are fed into the indicator. OK, so on using tablets, I think this is my last best practice. Uh, so computer assisted interviewing. So I th as I, I already mentioned before, for the time use, I mean, it's hard to implement on paper the ones who did the time use, right? But imagine doing that in a tablet. It's even harder. <laughs> so when you say, OK, doing it in a tablet, oh, I think I'll stick to the paper. I think I like the paper better. So uh, some, what people have done, some people, is to implement the time use section on paper and then transfer to the tablet after the interview. Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind when using tablets is to incorporate as many data quality checks or constraints into the programming as possible. So. You know that the time cannot exceed 24 hours. Put that constraint in so that whereas the enumerator is doing the interview, when they hit 24 hours, there's going to be an error. They have to correct while they're there at the moment. Um, so uh, other things. Uh, when you have um, a female-only household, they're saying they're a de jure household. There's no man in this household. But then they're saying they have a joint decision with their spouse. Like, 
Where's the spouse? Who's the spouse? Who is this man? So it, it's a red flag. So it means that, okay, either you made a mistake, something is misreported, or there's somebody else in the household that you didn't capture, because this is not really a female-only household, right? So some things like that, these are things that can be included in the program, and it will save you a lot of cleaning, a lot of grief, if you can already put that, take advantage of the programming process to include those data quality checks, so that your data comes to you clean, as, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, so, so now to the last part of this chapter, which is going over the questionnaire. You've already seen it and used it yourself, in, you know, different subsections of it. So now let's talk about how the different um, questions feed into the different indicators and how we decide who has adequate or inadequate achievements, how we score the indicators. So here we're, we're using the 1.1, which is the same one you did your role-playing exercise on. And the reason we're using 1.1 is that although abbreviated WEA is the newer version, um, like I said, we're still doing validation analysis. And depending on your needs, you, you, you may want to use the full WEA instead. It's also easier to use that. Once you know what happens with the full WEA, it's very easy to collapse it to the A way up. So I think if you learn the, the full, uh, we can do it as an exercise and you can you can just do the A way up on your own. So it should be no problem. Uh, but not the reverse, right? If I teach you the A way up and then you wanted to use the full, then we'll need to do another training. So, okay. So so here's an example sort of slide. This is how I'll, I'll present the, the questionnaire. So we'll put the module title at the top. Uh, I'm going to show you what the questions look like. Um, the rows and columns that are in white are what we're using to calculate the indicator we're talking about. The questions that are highlighted in gray are not used for the indicator. So all the parts that we're not using for the indicator that we're talking about will gray it out so that you can focus your attention on the items, the cells that are in white. Um, and then the code's in red. So whenever we have uh, response codes like this, we've marked in red those codes that demonstrate adequacy. So all the responses that correspond with adequacy, we try to highlight them for you so that you know that once those are selected, or if that's the response, then that means adequacy. Okay, so this is just an example slide. So, so let's proceed. Production is the first domain we have two indicators. So the first indicator is input and productive decisions. And, and you can take a if you can't see because you know the, the type is a little small, you can go ahead and, and look at your own, your module. So the module number is right up here. Uh, you want to look at it more closely. So here, as you recall, here are the questions about production uh, decision making. So here we're only interested in rows A, B, C, and F. So these are the agricultural activities food crop farming, cash crop farming, livestock raising, and if applicable, fishing or fish pond culture. And um, so all of these rows we're using, and we're only interested in the questions, did you participate, because this is a filter question, if they say yes, then how much input did you have in making decisions about the activity? If they say input in some or most, then it's adequate. So for every row, they could have adequacy for each of these activities, right? Here, 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 and here. So this is input in decision-making um, indicator. This is the first part of, the, of that indicator. The second part is in this section, G5A. And that's why for those groups who, who did this um, example in your role-playing exercise, that's why I put those together, because they actually feed into the same indicator. So here we're asking, for, again, the agricultural categories only, when decisions are made regarding this activity, who is it that normally takes the decision? Circle all applicable. Now, as long as self is circled, that's adequacy. So they have adequate achievement as long as self or any combination with self is um, selected. Uh, if they choose self, so note, do not ask G502 if self is the only response. If they say, I make the decision and nobody else, I make it on my own. 
we don't need to ask them if they can feel they can make this. They're already making the decision. So we skip this part. But if they are doing joint decision making, so self plus somebody else, then you ask this question, to what extent do you feel you can make your own personal decisions regarding the activity if you wanted to? If they are making this decision, they feel they can make the decision to the medium or high extent, then it's also adequate. So even if they're doing joint decisions, we want, them, we want to ask them, to what extent are you making decisions? And the reason we do that is that some people can say, I'm participating in decision with my spouse. But actually, I'm just being informed. I'm not really making the decision. So we want to distinguish between joint decisions that are really involved, like you're really partners and we're both discussing it and we're all or both our opinions are taken into account. Or it's just, I let you know, oh, this is what we're going to do. But actually, you cannot really decide. So, so sometimes, if that's the case, then the person here will say, oh, small extent or not so much, even though I report myself as a joint decision maker. OK, so those two things. Um, now, this is the cutoff. So for this, for, um, for this uh, indicator, input in productive decisions, a person is considered inadequate if the individual participates but does not have at least some input in decisions or does not make the decisions nor feels he, can, he could at least to a medium extent. So basically all those red that's just summarizing in words what we showed you in the red codes. Aggregation method. So, I mean, if you look at it, these, we're, look, we're looking at four types of activities. So they have a response here, they have a response here, right? And, and same thing for this section. So how do you aggregate all of that information into, so are they adequate or in, inadequate with respect to this indicator? So the aggregation method is respondent must have achievement in two. So they must be above the threshold for two activities. So if they are above the threshold, one here and one here, that counts as two activities. Or two here and then none in the other, that counts as two activities. So two activities and two um, responses that fall under adequacy, then they're counted as, as uh, being, having adequate achievement. Does that make sense? So the next uh, indicator is autonomy. So autonomy in production. So here, so this one, it looks longer, but actually easier. So autonomy. So here we have the vignette. So I, I grade this out. As I said, the first story we don't need in calculation. Um, now, right. So in the to calculate the RAI, here are the response codes. So completely the same, and I, I put it up here, but you could look at this part, right? Completely the same or somewhat the same, and completely different or somewhat different. So this code, completely the same is four, somewhat the same is three. This is how it's scored. Somewhat different is two, and completely different is one. So here, because completely the same and somewhat the same is one and two, we recode it to four and three, okay? For completely different or somewhat different, it's already correct. So completely different is one, somewhat different is two. So no need to change that. You use the response as is. Okay? Now, for each set of stories, so for every row, oh no, for each set of stories, which is the four stories here. So for this line, they either say yes or no. So they either answer this question or that question. So they'll have one, one so for this story, you'll have one score. So let's say, who did the vignettes? Yes. So tell us, what was the answer here? So for each set of stories, calculate the relative autonomy index, which is a weighted average of those scores. So it's minus 2 times G4A2, minus G4A3, plus 3 times G4A4. And it's a complicated formula, but this is the this is what's called the relative autonomy index. So it's a weighted sum of the responses. So it's not it's not very intuitive, but that's the formula. So this this in indicator comes out of the um, self determination from the psychology literature, where they there there's, there was a lot of work around um, motivation for decision making. And that's where these weights come from. So these are standard weights in that literature. And we just use them and apply them to agriculture. 
Okay, so we use the same weights. Minus 2 for here, mi minus 1 for here. And, oh, minus 2, minus 1, and 3 for the weights, right? And these are the scores. So, uh, so the cutoff is inadequate if the RAI is less than or equal to 1. So, again, it's a weighted sum of the 3 for the three sets of activities, right? So the aggregation method is respondent must have achievement in at least one activity. So if they have a score of at least one, or no, less than or equal to one. Is this less than or should it be greater than? I think it should be greater than or equal to one. This might be wrong, sorry. Let me double check that. I think it's greater than or equal to one. Uh, because higher number should give you, the, what, what has the positive weight is the, is the intrinsic, um, intrinsic motivation. So it should be positive. And RAI ranges from negative 9 to positive 9. So, um, okay. So if, if, they have, if they have at least one that has one or higher, then, then they're adequate. So in your case, since the score is 9, adequate. Okay, so that's autonomy. Whew, that's just one domain. Okay, now you're getting the hang of it, so the rest will be quicker. Resources, so we have ownership of assets for our first indicator. So here's the ownership section, and I, I sort of cut it off so that we can see all the categories in one line. So this is the part where we ask them about household ownership of assets, and the question we're interested in, who would you say owns most of the item? Um, so we have, for all these categories, so all of these categories we use. If they say self in any, then they, we count them as an owner, either jointly or by themselves, right? So all the self, we pay attention to whether they said, they mention themselves as an owner. So, when is the person not achieving ownership? If the household owns the type of asset, but the person does not own it solely or jointly. So here, remember, we ask first, does the household have this? He says, yes, the household have it. Who would you say owns most of the items? And then they say somebody else. So they're not, they don't have, they don't own it. They would only own the assets that the household owns and they say that they're part of the owners, either by themselves or with somebody else, okay? Okay, so what's the aggregation method? Achievement if owns solely or jointly at least one asset. So if they have ownership of any of those assets except if it's only one small asset defined as poultry, non-mechanized equipment, or small consumer durable. And these are the categories. So going back, poultry, non-mechanized equipment, and small consumer durables. So if everything else the, ho the household owns and they don't own it, and this is the only thing they own, they're still not adequate. Okay? So that's ownership. The next indicator, very similar, purchase, sale, or transfer of assets, and you've already seen it. So it's the same idea. Basically, across all the assets, if they, you know, the response is here, if they claim that they are part of the decision, whether by themselves or jointly, then that's adequate. So for this indicator, the household is, it has inadequate achievement in purchase, sale, or transfer of assets. If they do not own any asset, the household doesn't have the asset, or they own the type of asset, but they don't participate in any decision. So, it, it, the, you know, the household has land, but the, but the respondent doesn't participate in decisions on it, even jointly. Um, the aggregation method is achievement if makes at least one type of decision solely or jointly over at least one type of asset except if the decision is over one small asset. And so here, the reason why there's a separate um, indicator for purchase, sale, or transfer of assets is to capture use rights. So in some cases, they may not report that they own something, but if they have rights to use an asset, then in some context, that is what is empowering, is the ability to use an asset rather than to own it and not, yeah, and not make decisions about it. Um, so in access to credit, so here we have the sources of, of lending, and then we ask them, has anyone in your household taken any loans or borrowed in the last year? Who made the decision to borrow, and who makes the decision about what to do with what you borrowed? 
Uh, so again, if they mention themselves in those decisions, then they're adequate. Um, so they are inadequate if the respondent has, the household has no credit or did not borrow, or the household used the source of credit, but the person did not participate in decisions. So the, in the aggregation method is achievement if participated in at least one credit decision over any source. So as long as they made a decision in over one type of credit, then we count them as having achievement in access to and control over credit. Okay. So income. So so this is again one of the complicated ones because it's in two places. So here we have only one indicator, control over the use of income. And similar to the production section, we have the question, how much input did you have in decisions on the use of income generated from these activities? And since we're talking about income and we know income is fungible, we use all categories. So we don't restrict it only for agriculture. It, we, we use the the responses for everything, because we're interested in control over income. So as long as they say input in some decisions, at least some decisions, then they're adequate. Okay? The second part is this section on decision making. And here we only look at wage or salary employment and expenditure categories. So for these things, we ask if they make the decision by themselves or with somebody else. And if they make the decision then they're by themselves, then they're adequate. If they make the decision jointly, then we ask them the next question, to what extent do you feel you can make the decision? If it's medium to a high extent, then they're adequate. Okay. So this is all now sounding familiar. Right? We're, we're repeating the same patterns here. So control over the use of income. The person has inadequate achievement if the individual participates in the activity but does not have input in decisions over income, remember, or does not make decisions nor feels they could make a decision at least to the medium extent. So they're doing the activity, but they don't control the income. So achievement if individual has some input in at least one activity. So that's the threshold, just one, as long as it's not only minor household expenditures. That's the only exception. So um, the idea here is that some households have very diverse livelihoods and some households don't. Right? So we do achievement in any because even if there's just one activity in the household, that should be enough. We don't want them to, we don't want to put it in, I mean, a, a household with two activities is not necessarily better than a household with just one, right? The one could be very productive. So that's why they don't need two. They're very efficient, same. So, so that's why one is the threshold. Okay. We're going very, and this actually, it, it becomes easier from here. So leadership, this is very simple. Uh, group membership. So in group membership, we're interested in this question. Well, first you ask them, is there this group in the community? Yes or no. If there's a group, are you an active member? Yes or no. And if they say yes, then they're adequate. If they say no, then they're inadequate. So uh, anyway, and then of course you have all these different group types and they should be formal or informal. So now since that issue I talked about earlier where formal was inadvertently excluded, now we are explicit that this, this should be formal and informal. And again, if it's not listed, add it. Okay, so if you're not inadequate, if not part of any group, achievement in at least one. Very simple. Okay, speaking up in public, same thing, simple. As long as they say they're comfortable, as long as it's a yes, they're adequate in at least one context. So the first context is deciding on infrastructure. Sorry? Even with difficulty? Right. So even with difficulty, because they say yes, but with difficulty. Even with difficulty, as long as they say there's some degree, if I really need to speak up, it's not easy for me, but I can do it, then we still think they have the ability to speak up. So. It's in, they're inadequate if they're not comfortable speaking in public. And aggregation is achievement in at least one, at least one context, you're comfortable. Okay, and remember, this was very difficult to ask in some places. So we, you know, we ended up dropping this. Time use. First indicator is workload. And although the module is very complicated to look at, it's actually very simple to score because you can add up time. And you have a total time, right? So, right? Uh, now, the key thing to remember here is that workload includes categories E through P, which includes both market and non-market work. Um, 
And then the formula is here, total time spent includes primary and secondary activities. So secondary activities is weighted as one half. So we take the sum of primary and 0.5 of secondary. Um, so here's an example of how it's scored, right? And you've seen this. Those of you who did the time use uh, have, uh, have done it. I'm not going to ask you, because it's very hard to count all those cells in your example, whether you think the person is adequate or not. Um, uh, oh, and then the other thing um, I wanted to add is that there is another uh, question here added that's not included in the calculation of the index, but it's useful in analysis, so we fought to include it. In the last 24 hours, did you work at home or outside the home more than usual, about the same as usual, or less than usual? Because imagine before we didn't have this, and we don't know if the reason they're reporting no work is because it was not a typical day or there was a festival or whatever, they were ill, or because they really didn't work. So we couldn't distinguish the two. So with this, you can actually know the difference. Okay. Now some of you um, complain, those of you who worked on this module may have noticed that it's very, uh, I have already said, that it's very difficult to fill out. And especially you were very vocal about that. Um, you would be interested to know so that there is an alternative. So all of this, I mean, pay attention to these entries. Here is an alternative way that's simpler. And it captures exactly the same information I showed you below. So the only difference here, so this is what I'm calling the tablet-friendly time use module. And this is currently being piloted by the Haiti Midterm Survey for Feed the Future. So instead of having the categories on, on the rows, we have primary and secondary. And yeah. the enumerator fills out the code for the activity instead of just drawing a line. Yeah. So here you can see immediately if there are gaps, and you can see where the secondary activity. Are. And this is actually more tablet friendly because this is this is easier to program. Yeah, and I friendly, right? You you don't have to in Tagalog. We have a word called duling. It makes you cross eyed to look at the to look at the very small. So uh, you know the cells in in this example, right? Like how how can you even tell which ones are the same line? Here I call, we colored it so it makes it easy, but it's actually not that easy in the field. Here it's easier. And you can always see, oh, there's a gap here, there's a gap there. Um, the other thing we're adding, so we're piloting this version in the project layer. And the other thing we're, at, we're uh, adding is there will be a checkbox at the bottom saying, were you responsible for caring for a child while you were doing any of the activities? So you just tick the box. It's like, oh, this time, yeah, check, 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 check. There was a child, check, 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 check. I was watching a child. Because typically, especially for women, it's the care activities that are underreported. Next, I'm going to ask you a question about how satisfied you are. So this is a Likert scale. Um, please give your opinion on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 means you are not satisfied, and 10 means you are very satisfied. If you are neither satisfied or dissatisfied, this would be 5 on the scale. So how satisfied are you with your available time for leisure activities, like visiting neighbors, watching TV, listening to the radio, seeing movies? So they just give a score. And when it's, and if they're not satisfied, they're inadequate, and there's no need to aggregate because it's just one question. Now, what we found here is that because women have low expectations, they actually are satis more satisfied than the men. It's the men who are very dissatisfied with their leisure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, and that's, I think, consistent across many countries. Oh, okay. So that's the last thing. So that, thank you so much for your attention tonight.